Great. Good evening. Welcome to the Newman Center's 2021 Faith and Reason Lecture. We're so happy to have Dr. Holly Ordway back with us. We always prefer to have you in person. However, we're grateful for technology as well that wherever you are right now, you're able to join us and share some of your wisdom and what you've gleaned from your years of studies, right? With uh, of Tolkien and the Inklings group. So we're really excited about tonight's talk. Why don't we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit and fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle within them the fire of their love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, patron of the Universal Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, my name is Father Peter. For those who have uh, who are joining us for the first time at the Newman Center, so thank you for being here this evening. I know that uh, many people, many of us, are, are have been inundated with invitations to to online lectures, but I can guarantee you that this will be uh, an, a, a lecture worth participating in, especially because we've been so busy with either academic work, you know, in our churches. Uh, there's a lot of news that we're being uh, sent right all the time to to read and the pro or to listen to and it can be useful but at the same time it can also be a little bit uh, disheartening and one of the beautiful things is when we can pick up a good book a book that will provide us with nourishment right so intellectual nourishment but also something that can communicate to us truth the truth of God, right? And the beautiful things in the world. And so we're grateful again for this opportunity. And hopefully this period that we've been in, right? This extended uh, retreat um, was an opportunity for many people to maybe dust off some of the books that you have on your shelves that you've left aside because you've been too busy with other things. And in particular, of course, uh, Tolkien. Again, who's, a, uh, who's a favorite of uh, his eminence himself. So he's spoken about, about him very often. The Lord of the Rings, I think, is his favorite book or one of his favorite books. And for many of our community as well, it's been subject to a very uh, famous uh, movie series. And of course, uh, it was entertaining, but nothing like the book itself can really communicate the depth of the wisdom right, uh, that guided the, the hand of Tolkien and the many others like him. All right, so um, I'm very happy again to introduce or reintroduce Dr. Holly Ordway. And uh, many of you uh, know her and we really enjoyed your first lecture uh, over two years ago when you spoke about your conversion story. And that was subject of a book as well that you published. And, uh, and that was very moving for a lot of people to know that uh, how you went from atheism to a life committed to the to, to Christ, right, and to His Church, so it's uh, it's a beautiful way to be able to see like, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in the heart of every person, right? So in every person, we're on Sunday. We're going to hear in the Gospel how um, the Lord was waiting for the Greeks to come, right? So they were the non that they were the Gentiles, the non Jews. He was waiting for them to come, and it was at that point that. Right, uh, his mission had been complete. He was now, uh, he is now ready to lay his life because all peoples of the earth were called to come and to know, to love, and to worship him. And it's beautiful to see how God's grace never gives up on anyone. He didn't give up on you. And we pray that your life will be an example uh, to many others as well. So thank you so much. So to introduce uh, Holly, just a little bit about her. There's been some changes. Your your uh, curriculum vitae has increased, so we're very happy for you. Uh, Dr. Ordway is a fellow of faith and culture now at the Word of Fire Institute and visiting professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University. She holds a PhD in English from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and she's the author of Tolkien's Modern Reading, Middle Earth Beyond the Middle Ages, published by Word on Fire Academic Press. Apologetics and the Christian Imagination, an integrated approach to defending the faith, and numerous chapters and articles on imaginative apologetics. C.S. Lewis, 
Tolkien and the Inklings. She's also a subject editor for the Journal of Inkling Studies and a published poet, and her website is hollyordway.com. So with that, let us give Holly a very warm welcome. All right, well, thank you very much, Father. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so let's see. Um, I would like to share my screen here. Well, let's see, share screen. All right. All right, so um, this is the title of my talk. And I'm just very, very pleased to be with you tonight. Um, I'm sad that it has to be in, you know, not in person, but in, in virtual reality. Um, but it's better to, to do this than not to be able to come at all. And I, uh, I look forward to visiting with you again in person sometime because it was a real pleasure two years ago to be able to visit Toronto and meet with people in person. Glad to be here tonight. Looking forward to our Q&A after my talk. And, uh, and we'll carry on. So the title of my talk for tonight is Tolkien and the Catholic Imagination. And I wanna unpack that a little bit first before we start kind of in the reverse direction, because to say Tolkien and the Catholic Imagination suggests obviously that Tolkien has something to say for us on the subject of the Catholic Imagination. And indeed he does, um, as we will see. Um, but we should heed the advice that Treebeard gives to the uh, young hobbits Merry and Pippin in The Lord of the Rings. The great shepherd of the trees tells them, don't be hasty, young hobbits, don't be hasty. So let's make our way through these intriguing phrases. The Catholic imagination. And this will lead us through some important questions along the way. So what is the imagination? What is its relationship with reason? What does the imagination have to do with the Christian faith? And what does it mean for the imagination to be Catholic? So we'll step through each of those things in turn, and then we will look at what Tolkien has to say, what his Catholic imagination is, how it works, and look at his own creative response as a devout Catholic to modern literature, uh, modern culture, and finally close by considering what we can learn from him. So first, our question is, what do I mean by imagination? So at the most basic level, the imagination is what allows us to conceive in our minds the image of something that is not present. And this is what Tolkien himself calls the mental power of image making. And we use the imagination, for instance, when we're reading a story and we create a picture in our minds of what the author is describing. And we also use the imagination, for instance, when we're daydreaming or when we're envisioning future events or hypothetical events. Now, this is a fairly straightforward um, understanding of the word imagination, but it is a fairly limited one. It tends to make us think of the imagination as kind of an optional extra, like dessert. So sure, chocolate cake is really nice, but it's not necessary. Even I, who really like chocolate, must concede it's not actually necessary. And we may have given up desserts for Lent. So we could argue, in fact, that not only are desserts not absolutely necessary, but maybe they're, you could argue they're even unhealthy and that we'd be better off without them. And in fact, that is an attitude that a lot of Christians do take about imaginative literature and the arts in general, that they're sort of spiritual sugary stuff, you know, that, that, you know, it's more intellectually or spiritually healthy to stick to the, you know, solid nutritional nonfiction. But that's actually a very limited and incomplete idea of what the imagination is. In fact, the imagination is a fundamental human faculty. It's a necessary part of human cognition. And quite literally, we can't have rational thought without the use of the imagination. So we have our senses, we have uh, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, and these bring us information about the world. But how do we make sense of that data? How do we draw conclusions about what's true and what's false? And in order for our 
reason, our intellect, to make these judgments about what's true or false, it has to have something meaningful to work on. And that's what C.S. Lewis is talking about when he writes that reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. And that's a line that gets often quoted, but not necessarily completely understanding what he's getting at in this, in this point. Michael Ward, commenting on this idea and explaining it, um, points out that things must rise up out of the swamp of nonsense into the realm of meaning if the imagination is to get any handle on them. Only then can we begin to judge whether their meanings are true or false. Before anything can be either true or false, it must mean. And that is a really critical point about the imagination. That last line, before anything can be either true or false, it must mean. If something is purely nonsense, it has no meaning. And there is no, no way to say it's true or false. It's just nonsense. So our senses bring in the data. So for instance, right now, those you're getting by your ears, the sound of my voice speaking to you. Now, how do you make sense of that? The imagination is acting to form this data, sound waves, into recognizable English words. And then the reason can act to think about these words, to make a judgment on them. Do they make sense? What's the idea being presented? And that's the order in which these things are happening in our minds. First, we have the sense data. Then we have the imaginative picture. And last of all, we have the reasoned judgment. Sense, senses, imagination, reason. So the imagination is really forming a critical point in our judgments about truth and falsity and our ability to think about anything. Now, most of the time, this meaning-making function of the imagination happens so naturally and intuitively that we don't even notice it, but it's fundamental to all of our thinking and indeed to all of our judgments. Only when something has meaning, which is generated by the imagination, can we begin to use our reason to judge whether it's true or false. And so in this broad sense, the imagination is always at work in everyone, whether we realize it or not, and whether our imaginations are working well or they're working badly. And this is of very great import to us today as Christians in our modern culture, because many of the foundational concepts of the Christian faith have lost their meaning for most people completely lost their meaning. They become nonsense words, jargon words, just, just sounds, these, these things the Christians say. As the venerable Fulton Sheen once said, there are not 100 people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church, but there are millions who hate what they wrongly perceive the Catholic Church to be. Now he was speaking of the United States, but this is true, very much the case the same in Canada, in the UK, in Europe. And if we consider this faulty picture of the Christian faith in general and the Catholic Church in particular, it's even more the case if we look at the broader category of the nuns, the religiously indifferent, who form the single most significant field for evangelization today. To the average young person who we might pass in the street or have sitting in our college classroom or next to us in the coffee shop, what does the word God even mean? What do words like heaven, hell, sin, salvation, prayer, resurrection, what do these words even mean? Well, that's a topic for a whole other talk, which I'm not going to give tonight, <laughs> but suffice it to say that these words mean little or nothing to most people in the modern day. So the image that most people have in their minds of Christianity in general, and of the Catholic Church in particular, often does not correspond to the reality. Now, this is not simply a question of facts. It's a question of meaning. And that's because the faulty image shapes how we respond to facts. If the image that I hold of the church is that it's a leftover bit of culture from past centuries, irrelevant at best and toxic at worst, 
then of course I'm not going to bother to investigate further. Why would I, right? When words like sin and grace are just, you know, sounds, things that things that those Christians say, they don't have any real meaning. There's no reason for a person to consider them seriously in relation to their own lives. We have to find a concept meaningful before we care whether or not it's true. And this is the fundamental work of the imagination. The imagination is foundational to the reason and therefore it's foundational to the action of the will. So this, I hope, has sketched out a little bit of the groundwork of why it is that the imagination has really a vitally important part to play in our day-to-day -day lives as human beings and in our sharing of the Christian faith. And that takes us to our second question. What makes for a Catholic imagination? That's a very big question. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to venture three points that I think at least touch on the essential elements, uh, drawing from this understanding that we have of the Catholic Church as encompassing the fullness of the Christian faith. So first, I would suggest that a Catholic imagination means recognizing that being a Catholic um, in, embraces every part of the human experience, from conception to death, in work and leisure time, in sorrow and loss, as well as in joy and love, being part of a family, but also moving through the world as an individual, experiencing doubts, seeking answers. The Catholic imagination encompasses or should encompass um, much more than just a Sunday morning picture of the faith. Second, a Catholic imagination means recognizing that being a Catholic involves the whole self, body, mind, soul, intellect, emotions, reason, will. It's all part of who we are, made in the image of God, and by his grace, redeemed and brought into his own body. All of us brought into him. And this leads naturally into a sacramental view of the world and of our place in it. As the poet Dana Joya puts it in his essay, The Catholic Writer Today, Catholic writers tend to see that nature is sacramental, shimmering with signs of sacred things. Indeed, all reality is mysteriously charged with the invisible presence of God. So as physical beings in this created world that God made and that he called good, we experience his grace mediated through material things. So mediated through the bread and wine that becomes the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ, through the water of baptism that washes us clean of original sin, through the priest's human words, speaking the words of absolution in the sacrament of reconciliation. And we can appreciate the way that more broadly the material world provides an abundance of ways for us to understand our faith and to grow in it from relics and rosaries to pilgrimages and private prayers, we have lots of ways to grow in the faith in this world that God made and put us in. We're not souls who just happen to have bodies. No, no, no. We are incarnate beings. We are body and soul together. And third, a Catholic imagination means seeing that we human beings are fallen and the image of God is damaged in us. But it's not, contra some views, totally destroyed or utterly defaced. We must reckon with sin and its effects on every level of our lives and our societies. But even when people are separated from God, alienated from him, disbelieving in him, they still have access to truths about him, about himself, about the world that he created. And this is just by virtue of being human and, and living in this world that God made. So the Catholic imagination recognizes that there can be truth discovered and expressed in the most unlikely of places by people who might outwardly disavow any Christian belief whatsoever. So that gives us a little bit of a picture of the Catholic imagination. 
But these have all been very abstract, higher order kinds of issues. It's as if in Tolkien's world, we've been hobnobbing with the Valar and the opening chapter of the Silmarillion. Now let's shift over to more specific and concrete instances as if we were paying a visit to Bilbo Baggins in his comfortable hobbit hole at Bag End in the Shire. We've seen that one way of understanding the Catholic imagination is to see that it's capacious, indeed cosmic in its reach, and that it's incarnational and sacramental in its expression. And this has implications for how we engage with culture as Catholics. So now we ask, what can we learn from Tolkien on this topic? And now allow me to share my screen again. What can we learn from John Ronald Rule Tolkien? So in order to answer this question, what can we learn from Tolkien? We first need to address a very common and a pervasive misconception about Tolkien's attitude towards modern culture. The popular image of Tolkien that we see in all sorts of ways, including in the recent um, biopic Tolkien, um, we have this image of Tolkien as totally averse to modernity, as if he was firmly stuck in the past by his own choice. It's routinely assumed by cultural commentators that he was a backward looking person and that he valued nothing beyond the boundaries of his professional interest in medieval literature. It's a, almost a joke that, oh, he cared about nothing past Chaucer. I mean, after all, wasn't he an arch conservative? For instance, he described gasoline powered chainsaws as one of the greatest horrors of our age. And he deplored what he called the present design of destroying Oxford in order to accommodate motor cars. One friend recalled that uh, while sitting in the backyard of Tolkien's house, a loud motorcycle came by and totally interrupted our conversation. Tolkien said, that is an orc. And although he wasn't actually responsible for the quip, literature stops in 1100, after that there's only books. It has often been attributed to him because it's so clearly the reactionary sort of thing that he might have said, clearly. Despite the fact that his books are globally popular in the 21st century, he's often viewed simply as stuck in the past, totally dismissive of anything modern. His biographer Humphrey Carpenter even claimed that Tolkien read very little modern fiction and took no serious notice of it. Well, <laughs> I have been working on researching this very topic for 10 years actually, um, that generated the book Tolkien's Modern Reading. And in my research for Tolkien's Modern Reading, I discovered that this view of Tolkien as stuck in the past, a Luddite who didn't read anything modern, who resisted all things from his contemporary age, this view is simply false. It's totally incorrect. <laughs> To be sure, Tolkien was professionally a medievalist, steeped in the languages and the literature of the Middle Ages, but he was also very interested in the literature and culture of the modern day. So let's take a little excursion through that. This is quite a startling view of Tolkien. Far from being a nostalgic and backward looking figure, Tolkien was consistently engaged with the modern world. He read the newspaper every day. And to one interviewer who seemed surprised by the fact that he even knew of such a thing as a newspaper, he said that he subscribed to three newspapers and added, I take a strong interest in what is going on, both in the university and in the country and in the world. He was very emphatic about this. One of his friends recalled group lunches with Tolkien where they argued the morality of the Nuremberg trials and discuss the moral aspect of atomic bombing and total war in general. This is someone who is up to speed with the major developments of the news of his day. In his 1959 retirement lecture, he declared, I have the hatred of apartheid in my bones. And this is very interesting and important. In his public opposition to the policy of apartheid, Tolkien predated the British anti-apartheid movement, 
and he predated the international backlash against apartheid prompted by the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. So given this context, it's noteworthy that he used his retirement speech, a significant event for the university, which was noteworthy enough to be reported on by the local press and had a full house. He used this speech to repudiate a racist regime that was not even yet a matter of widespread public concern in Britain. Now in his lecture, although he does immediately shift back to academic concerns, Tolkien knew academic politics. He knew, he was well aware that his audience would pick up on his remark as a political statement. Tolkien was also a willing and even an enthusiastic adopter of modern technology. Yes, I said that right. He used that newfangled device, the typewriter, not only for mundane administrative tasks, such as letter writing, but also for preparing manuscripts, both as an academic and as a creative writer. And this, for instance, is something that his friend C.S. Lewis flatly refused to do. In fact, Lewis even made his brother Warney type his letters for him. <laughs> Tolkien was also intrigued by the potential of audio recordings and the radio, two technologies that, again, were brand new in his day. He read various of his own poems onto tape recorders, even once doing his own sound effects. And he commented knowledgeably on the merits of different models of audio recorders. He made a number of radio presentations on Anglo-Saxon and Middle English verse for the BBC. We see a consistent interest in using up to the minute technology. And this is a mark of a man who's eager to see his work available in new media, who's exploiting the developments of modernity for his own ends. Now today, things like typewriters and tape recorders seem old fashioned and hardly, describe, hardly worth describing as technology at all. But in Tolkien's lifetime, they were at the cutting edge of progress and personal communication. So I dare say that if he were alive today, I venture that he'd be willing to try lecturing by Zoom. Now, if Tolkien accepted technology insofar as it helped his writing, what about technology such as the automobile, which is often assumed that he simply despised? And once again, we find his views were more complex than we might think. In an interview with the BBC, Tolkien remarked about cars that he loved riding them, liked driving them. And when pressed for more details, he explained that the problem is not the automobile per se, but that the proliferation of cars has resulted in destructive road building, such that, as he explains, a driver is no longer able to do the things for which motor cars were made. Nowadays, before you can get to the brooks for a picnic, the state road makers have smashed the brook and cut the trees down so that you can get there. I should have thought it's the road makers more than the motor car, which I dislike. They really are ruthless and foolish. So we see in this example how Tolkien objected strenuously to the abuse of technology, but he did not find technology to be evil in and of itself. Much has also been made of the supposed narrowness of his social circle, focusing on the male-only inklings. But Tolkien was married for over 50 years. He had a daughter, he had women friends among the English faculty, and he had many female students and academic collaborators in his decades as a teacher, both at Leeds and at Oxford. Moreover, he read many women writers throughout his life, and he took their work very seriously. And I found in my research that some of the authors he especially praised included Mary Renault, Agatha Christie, Beatrix Potter, and Edith Nesbitt. His interests, far from being narrow, were so wide ranging that one friend remarked that in conversation, he would go 60 miles an hour with a subject from apples to elephants. He didn't mention the Beatles, but just about everything else came into Tolkien's conversation. And so, we can see that he is a man of expansive interests and his reading of modern literature is similarly expansive. He enjoyed, as we might expect, a great deal of children's literature, including Lewis Carroll, but he also appreciated the American realist Sinclair Lewis, who we'll return to a little later in this lecture. He delighted in Agatha Christie's mysteries, but he also took very seriously the ultra-modern Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. 
He particularly enjoyed the poetry of Roy Campbell and Dylan Thomas. He read a great deal of science fiction, naming Isaac Asimov as a particular favorite. So the list of authors that I've included in Tolkien's modern reading is extensive and varied. By my count, there are nearly 150 modern authors and more than 200 specific titles that we can be certain that Tolkien read. He was not allergic to modern culture, far from it. He knew the literature of the past supremely well, but he also knew the literature of his present day. He read discerningly and he responded to what he read thoughtfully and creatively. Now, it's particularly worth noting that Tolkien, a devout lifelong Catholic, read many authors who had views very different from his own and engaged with their work seriously, appreciating literary merit where he found it without compromising his own deeply held beliefs. So for instance, he enjoyed H. Ryder Haggard's adventure tales, such as She and King Solomon's Mines, despite the fact that Haggard sometimes ventures into pantheism and spiritualism. He admired the science fiction of the dedicated atheist H.G. Wells. Now we tend to think of Wells today just in terms of stories like the War of the Worlds, but at the time, he was very much a Richard Dawkins-ish figure. Most notably, Wells wrote the massive outline of history, published in 1920, that presented a materialist, secularist view of history that flatly rejected the divinity of Christ and rejected the continuity of the church's teachings. Yet, despite his sharply differing views on matters theological, Tolkien held Wells' science fiction in high regard, calling him one of the forgotten old masters of science fiction. Another significant figure in this regard is the author E.R. Edison, who is known today, if at all, um, for the warm Ouroboros, a tale of heroic adventure on the planet Mercury. He deemed himself familiar with all that E.R. Edison wrote and praised him as the greatest and most convincing writer of invented worlds that I've read. Now, this praise is particularly interesting in view of his equally strong opposition to what he called Edison's peculiarly bad views. He believed that Edison was coming to admire arrogance and cruelty under the influence of an evil and indeed silly philosophy. Tolkien wasn't mincing words there. Now, Edison's philosophy, as is expressed in his novels, such as The Worm Ouroboros and the rest of the Zimianvian books, is consciously pagan or pantheistic. And Edison conceived of the universe as engaged in a constant eternal conflict between good and evil. Indeed, he argued that his own literary heaven had to contain an element of evil because it's a heaven of action. For Edison, goodness is equated with stagnation and boredom. Both the pantheism and the dualism of this view, which holds the necessity of evil, ran contrary to Tolkien's Catholic faith, which maintains that God and creation are distinct and that God's perfect goodness has no ontologically opposite. Tolkien also is morally serious. It's an event extent by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And he would therefore have rejected Edison's treatment of the problem of evil. Edison claims that suffering can be seen as amusing if we truly believe in immortality. Traumatic experiences, he suggests, can be held lightly as if they were, as he says, episodes invented perhaps and then laid aside as we ourselves might conceive and in a few minutes later reject again some theory of the universe in conversation after supper. And I think it's interesting to note in regard to their respective handling of the problem of pain that Tolkien saw frontline service in the Great War while Edison worked for the Board of Trade throughout the entire war year. So their serious philosophical differences, Tolkien called Edison a great writer and said that he read Edison's works with great enjoyment for their sheer literary merit. And among his fellow Christians, Tolkien was equally fair-minded. He greatly admired the work of his co-religionist G.K. Chesterton, for instance, saying that he held the arguments of the everlasting man to be absolutely valid. 
but he sharply criticized the work of another Catholic, Hilaire Belloc. He was a strong early supporter of the writings of C.S. Lewis, helping to get out of the Silent Planet published, but he had more qualified feelings about the Narnia Chronicles. But it's worth noting that the overblown claims about Tolkien's um, huge dislike of the, of the Narnia Chronicles are in fact overblown. He, he didn't care for them personally, but he didn't hate them. Um, he later described them as deservedly very popular, and he did keep the books on hand for his grandchildren to read. Now, there are many more examples, even, but even from this small sampling, we can see that Tolkien engaged willingly, eagerly, extensively, discerningly with a wide range of viewpoints in his reading of modern literature. And this tells us something about Tolkien's Catholic imagination. It's capacious, it's generous in spirit, it's thoughtful and discerning. So now let us turn to considering how Tolkien made use of what, um, what it was that he read. So let's consider the hobbits, these small, humble, and tough people who play such an important role in both the hobbits and the Lord of the Rings. So where did the hobbits come from? We can trace three distinct strands. Now I wanna note that in talking about these strands of influence on the hobbits, I am not by any means saying that this exhausts the source material for them or that this is the only place that, they, that Tolkien found material, merely that these are three strands that we can actually trace from the things that Tolkien himself has said. So where did they come from? One strand in the creation of the Hobbits is a book called The Marvelous Land of Snurgs by E.A. Wick Smith, a book that heard of this love. He names this book as, in his own words, an unconscious source book for the hobbits. The snurgs are child-sized and long-lived. Um, they're generous, they're gregarious people, loving company, and they have a great deal in common with hobbits as Tolkien would come to depict them a few years later, both in habits and in appearance. And here we can see an illustration of Snurgs. This is the illustration by Morrow from, uh, from the volume. You can see the Snurgs following some. So we can see in these illustrations, the, there are also under three foot tall hobbits, who, as they are described in The Lord of the Rings, have faces that are good natured rather than beautiful, broad, bright eyed, red cheeked. And it's worth observing that the Snurgs are depicted with bow and arrow, for Tolkien notes particularly that the hobbits were keen eyed and sure at the mark. A second strand are the rabbits of Beatrix Potter. Tolkien knew Potter's work well, and he held it in high esteem. C.S. Lewis once remarked that he and Tolkien have often played with the idea of a pilgrimage to see her at her home in the Lake District and pictured what fun it would be to shoulder aside the mobs of people who want to show you all the Wordsworth places with a brief rejoinder, we are looking for Miss Potter. Now, Beatrix Potter is best known for her rabbits, most notably Peter Rabbit, of course, but also his siblings Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail his cousin Benjamin and his uncle, Mr. Benjamin Bunny, who we see here um, wearing his pipe. Now these characters may well have contributed to the overall concept of hobbits, which have a distinctly rabbit quality, especially in the hobbits. For instance, we find that in a hole in the ground there lived, not unlike a rabbit, a hobbit. Bert the troll calls Bilbo a nasty little rabbit. And while the dwarves are trying to escape the goblins and wolves, Bilbo runs from tree to tree like a rabbit that has lost his hole and has a dog after it. One of the rescuing eagles later tells him, you need not be frightened like a rabbit, even if you look rather like one. Tolkien himself once admitted that in the creation of the name Hobbit, its faint suggestion of rabbits appealed to me. Now, like the Hobbits, the Rabbits, as invented by Beatrix Potter, are human-like, though not human. They're quick and quiet of foot. They're easily overlooked by large persons. They're garden-loving and hole-dwelling. 
And indeed, the, the rabbits live in very pleasant holes, much like hobbit holes, as we can see from the illustration of that we have here. Here we have um, Peter Rabbit and his family living in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree, later lauded as the neatest, sandiest hole of all. And here, Mrs. Rabbit makes a living by selling various goods, including rabbit tobacco, which we can see hanging in bunches on the wall there. And the rabbit tobacco is what we would call lavender. And perhaps such an image helps contribute to the idea of hobbits living in comfortable holes underground with plenty of food and a well-stocked tobacco jar, which is the final word of the hobbit. Now, a third and quite different strand is the no novel Babbit. This novel- Yes. Uh, are we sorry about that? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're having problems uh, hearing you. There's a lot of uh, static feedback or something. Oh, so we're just getting, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just that uh, people keep asking if, if you can double check your, your microphone. Okay, um, hold on then. Um, sure, sorry about me... that. I'm very sorry about that. Um, it's... We just want to be able to pay to give all of our attention, but there seems to be a lot of noise, intermittent noise. Yeah, I had my phone turned off so that I was not able actually to see. Okay. Let me give it a try to sure. putting on headset. And, Thank you so uh, much. That might help. Thank you. Because there's no noise in my end, but right now we're okay. Uh, right now it's okay. Ah, okay. Well, that's I haven't plugged in anything yet, but you are okay now. For for now it is, but I'm not sure what the issue is. But it it just it's inter it's there's a lot of intermittent static. So uh, multiple uh, participants have been asking. Uh, oh dear! To double uh -huh. check. Yeah. Well, let me. I'm so sorry. Yes, that's right. Um, hold on. Let me just get my plug in my head my headset. Sure. That might help. Yes, it's odd because it's coming through perfectly fine on my end, but the internet can sometimes be extremely mm -hmm. persnickety. All right, give me. Sorry. Yes, it's amazing how one's headphones tie themselves up into knots when left <laughs> alone to their devices. Yeah. Technology okay. isn't perfect, so it's not a problem. All right, we will we will Great. there. So I'll text you if there's any other issue. Thank you so much. Yes, I had, yes, I I had better again for interrupting you. That's quite all right. I had better put my yes, I always turn my phone off. Okay. Um, when <laughs> Sure. Yeah, because that way I don't get interrupted by, yes. for instance, spam calls. But this would be the one instance in which I needed to. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. So now we need to find out if I can switch over to the uh, microphone. Okay. Where are we? Um, I need to return back to the Zoom call. Oops, stop share. Okay. I don't. I don't know how to change my audio settings. Uh, okay. Now we should be getting audio through my headset. If we that's can hear working. you perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Well, then we'll we'll do that. Okay. okay. We will attempt to do that. I am so sorry. Um, well, we hopefully we had enough. <laughs> we heard enough of the uh, of the um, previous lecture. All right. Uh, so we are picking up with Beatrix Potter. No, we are picking up with Babbitt. We left off. We had a Beatrix Potter, um, and now we are switching over to Babbitt. Um, right. Um,
And you know, I actually suspect that what was causing the problem was probably my notes because I'm not actually sure where the microphone on my computer is. And I wouldn't be surprised if my notes were rubbing up against them. This might have been the problem. So my apologies, but we will carry on. Right. So now looking at the novel Babbitt, um, which we saw the cover of that. So I am just going to leave that. You saw the cover of Babbitt. So that is now the novel that we are talking about. Um, now, this novel, published in 1922 by the American realist author Sinclair Lewis, is a satire on American middle class culture and social conformism. And it was singled out for special attention when Lewis won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And Tolkien said that he had read all of the work of Sinclair Lewis, and he explained to an interviewer that the word hobbit might have been associated with Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt. And he goes on to say, Babbitt has the same bourgeois smugness that hobbits do. His world is the same limited place. And this is a sizable admission. Here, Tolkien has conceded three things, a linguistic debt, a parallel with his protagonist's personality, and a parallel with a constrained home life of Hobbiton. Now, the character of George F. Babbitt certainly has something in common with Bilbo at the start of The Hobbit. A well-fed member of the bourgeoisie, he has a hidden romantic streak. However, this underdeveloped aspect of Babbitt's personality emerges in a way that one cannot imagine occurring in the Shire. His discontent with small town social life leads him to have an extramarital affair. And although he eventually gives up his fling and returns to his wife, it's at the cost of accepting a stultifying routine that leaves him feeling disappointed and defeated. Now, Bilbo's character development in The Hobbit, in the Hobbit shows, like Babbitt, a reaction against smugness that allows him to embrace his Tookish romantic side and to go off on adventures. But unlike Babbitt, however, Bilbo's motivation for leaving home is morally sound, and he returns happily enough to his roots. Of course, this combination of similarity and difference is entirely to be expected. No author worth the salt, let alone an author as exacting and careful as Tolkien, ever takes over a source or an influence lock, stock, and barrel. There's always a transforming alchemy at work in the process of digestion, assimilation, and reconstitution. Nevertheless, we do here have a striking example of Tolkien freely admitting a connection between his work and that of a contemporary American writer. So we have Snurgs, Rabbits, and Babbitts. Tolkien took in these different sources over a span of years in very different contexts, and he assimilated certain elements, rejected others, and added others. For instance, material that came from his own experiences, his own personality. All of this was grist to his imaginative mill, or to use his own image, it was leaf mold on the forest floor, formed by many different fallen leaves, which nourished his own tree of tales. And Tolkien himself conceded that not none of us can really invent or create in a void. So he recognized that he did not write in isolation and knew that he could not have done so even if he had wanted to. So what does this show us about the workings of the imagination? Now we should, working of his imagination in particular, now we should note that none of these three sources are explicitly Christian, let alone directly Catholic. They're part of the wider world of literary culture in which he operated, stories that he enjoyed with his children and books that he read for his own pleasure. And from these diverse materials taken freely and with appreciation from authors who may or may not have agreed with any of his religious views, he drew some of the ingredients for his characters who would provide in the end, some of the most deeply Christian images in Middle Earth. So we see, for instance, in The Hobbit, Bilbo is the burglar of the party. Now, this is hardly a Christian image at first glance, except that his role turns out to be far more than that of recovering the dwarves gold from the dragon smog's hoard, and thus fulfilling their goals of greed and vengeance. Rather, in the end, Bilbo absconds with the Arkstone, the one gem beyond price in the hoard, which he knows full well the dwarf Thorin would never part with 
Thorin is at this point afflicted by the dragon sickness, filling his heart with greed and violence. So Bilbo takes the Arkenstone, but then just hands it over to Bard the Bowman in order that it can be used for negotiations with the people on the lake, uh, lake tunnel and the elves on the one side and the dwarves on the other, so to avoid tragic violence. And he allows the Arkenstone to be counted as one fourteenth share of the, of the dragon's treasure, his own share of the treasure. And so he willingly sacrifices his own share of the wealth and his status among the dwarves for the good of others. Now, Bilbo's freedom from avarice allows him to become a Christ figure. And in the end, we see that his action brings about reconciliation and restoration. Now, Tolkien does not by any means make this into an allegory, but he skillfully draws our attention, if we have ears to hear, to the Christian connections. The key chapter for this aspect of the story is in fact titled, A Thief in the Night, alluding to our Lord's description of himself in Matthew chapter 24. And later, the dying Thorin is reconciled to Bilbo and calls him Good Thief. As Michael Ward points out in his essay, The Christian Ethic at the Heart of the Hobbit, Tolkien's story from first to last shows us the scriptural truth that the love of money is the root of all evil. And who can deliver those enthralled to such a distorted love? Only the thief in the night. And then turning to The Lord of the Rings, we see again that the hobbits are of central importance, both in terms of the story and its spiritual significance. Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin are childlike figures. They're weak in comparison to the mighty warriors like Aragorn and Boromir, and they're simple compared to figures that are wise and ancient like Gandalf and Elrond. Yet the fate of all the free peoples of Middle-earth in the end rests on these small shoulders. Frodo and Sam in particular are vivid Christ figures in their arduous trek across Mordor to cast the one ring into the crack of the doom. But all of the hobbits embody a deeply Christian image. In their childlike stature, we see a profound humility and we're reminded that Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Tolkien said of the Lord of the Rings that it is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why I have not put in or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion. It's a paradoxical statement. So we see that none of the characteristics of the hobbits are presented in an obvious or intrusive way, but they're richly and deeply Christian. It's not so much a paradox, it's the fact that Tolkien is using his skills as a storyteller to make the connections subtle, to make them hidden, and to make them more powerful by doing so. And this is just one of many Catholic connections in The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien offers rich theological connections below the surface, such as the resemblance between Galadriel and the Virgin Mary, and the Eucharistic quality of the Lemba spread. All of these elements are so deeply embedded in the story that they do not obtrude. The tale, he says, is consciously built on or out of certain religious ideas, but does not mention them overtly, still less preach them. Built on, but not preached about. Readers with knowledge of these things can notice them and catch the echoes, or not, as they prefer. And as Tolkien put it, the story is mainly concerned with the fall, mortality, and the machine, theologically rich ideas. And the foundation of these themes, even when presented implicitly, make them richly suited for what Tolkien called applicability, which is not allegory, but rather rests in the freedom of the reader to make connections. So we saw from this one example of the hobbits and three different strands that went into their making, that Tolkien is able to draw from a remarkably diverse set of sources, Snurgs, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny, George Babbitt, none of which were particularly Christian, let alone distinctively Catholic, in order to aid in the creation of stories and characters that are profoundly rooted in the Catholic faith. Furthermore, Tolkien's wide ranging tastes in modern reading reveal something characteristic about his sub created world. 
Nothing was too small or too grand, too weird or too ordinary, too silly or too dark to be left out. As the Catholic author Robert Hugh Benson once remarked, the Catholic who aspires to count all men as his brethren employs every vehicle that his romantic brain can suggest. Tolkien's Catholic uh, taste in literature, Catholic in the small c sense, meaning wide ranging, is a manifestation of his Catholic faith, capital C Catholic. It's extensive, expansive, inclusive. Taste and faith alike are formative for Middle Earth. And Tolkien's modern reading is important for us, not least because it shows his lifelong serious interest in modern culture. And here we have a great deal that we can learn from him. He shows us the value of reading widely, finding what is good, true, and beautiful, not just in works written by fellow believers, but also in, in the works of authors whose philosophical and religious views are contrary to our own. Such an exploration, done with an attitude of genuine appreciation for what is good, does not mean abandoning our beliefs and values, far from it. Rather, it allows us to enter into dialogue with those who do not yet share our faith. Tolkien did not feel obliged to agree with everybody whose books he read, definitely not, not even with people in his own tribe, so to speak. But this didn't stop him from reading their work and taking it seriously. He also shows us the value of reading charitably and with a generous spirit. Tolkien could certainly be curmudgeonly if he took against an author or a book, but his reading as a whole shows his willingness to allow himself to be challenged, his willingness to enter into new points of view. And he shows us that this wide ranging, charitable exploration of modern culture can and should result in a creative and transformative engagement with it. Tolkien did not ignore the problems of the modern world, such as war, doubt, suffering, ecological destruction, and totalitarianism. Rather, he made a profound response to it in the form of the stories that made up the Silmarillion, the Hobbits, and above all, the Lord of the Rings. We should not try to copy him, but rather to emulate him. Not to copy him because we don't need a rehash of the Lord of the Rings. And indeed it's such a vast and deeply layered book that it would be impossible to imitate. But emulation means learning to engage with contemporary culture as he did so that we can speak to our own time in fresh and powerful ways. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, Tolkien shows us by example, the value of an honestly lived faith. He experienced great suffering in his life, the loss of his father as a young child and of his mother as a boy, serving in the trenches of World War I, a conflict in which most of his close friends were killed, putting up with chronic illness, living through World War II in which two of his own sons served in uniform, Yet through it all, he kept a strong and sustaining faith in Christ. It's this confidence and trust that I would suggest helped him to make the Lord of the Rings a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, even while deliberately making that religious element hidden, subtle, operating beneath the surface of the story. So if we are to transform modern culture for Christ, will do well to take a lesson from this Oxford professor, this creator of the humble hobbits, to root ourselves so deeply in Christ that we can boldly and with confidence explore the whole wide world of our modern Middle Earth and find ways to proclaim its king. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Orbe, that was excellent. All right. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you could finally hear it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But that's okay. And we have uh, the questions are starting to come in. And uh, so one of the questions now, this is something that you alluded to earlier on, I hope I can convey the, the, the question here correctly. So in terms of the Catholic understanding of, of the material world, we tend to have a generally fa more favorable kind of view of the material word world compared to uh, some like certain fundamentalist Christians. So we see the material world as being good, but has been touched by original sin and everything has been redeemed by Christ. 
and therefore, um, I mean, the material world, he, the Lord communicates himself through the sacraments. So they're good and they're beautiful. So recognizing the inherent goodness of all things, um, we know as Catholics, at least, that we can see everything as, as, a, as a vehicle or as a way to communicate the, the divine. And therefore, we can see how someone great like Tolkien could have uh, done such incredible work as you've been able to describe this evening. And also somebody like C.S. Lewis, he was an Anglican, uh, but as an Anglican, uh, at the same time, there's still, there are similarities with, with, uh, with Catholics and therefore uh, their relation to the, what they believe to be sacraments. And, um, and there, there are similarities in the liturgy. So you see these two great authors, again, who have a different view of, uh, of their appreciation of the material world. And then you would look, for example, and compare and contrast that to fundamentalist Christians. Now, if you see that the world is inherently, or the material world is evil, then therefore, how willing are you to engage with the material world? And so the follow-up, the question from there is, are there um, writers of the, uh, of the caliber of, I guess, of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis um, that have developed over the years, uh, like in the, in the fundamentalist Protestant circles? Do they? Do well, they... That's, that's a very interesting question. Okay. Um, and it's, the answer is, I would say not really, no. Um, and it's interesting because I, this is something that evangelicals uh, evangelical Christians themselves um, are, are discovering and wrestling with the fact that um, their tradition in general, and even just evangelicalism in general in its healthy forms, not even the more fundamentalist branches of it, mm -hmm. has not really had a great track record for producing great novelists, not really. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and really the fact that Catholic and Anglicans who have a, a much more sacramental view of the world, Catholic and Anglican writers kind of have a real dominance over, you know, over Christian imaginative literature. Um, you can name a few exceptions, but they're, they're all definitely exceptions. Um, and I think it really does come from precisely what you're saying, Father, that when you have a sacramental view of the world, whether it's Eastern Orthodoxy or you know, high church Anglicanism or Catholicism, the sacramental view of the world, frankly, allows for better storytelling um, than, than the really almost Gnostic view that, that so tries to separate the Christian from the world. Um, and, and honestly, given that human beings are fundamentally narrative storytelling creatures, given that God has, you know, inspired the human authors of the Bible to write poetry, this, I think, tells us something about the truth of the sacramental vision, um, that it really points to something in the way that God made us and the way that he made the world. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, since the last time you were here, you, um, you've joined the Word on Fire Institute. And the Word on Fire Institute, congratulations once again. And uh, Bishop Barron is a great communicator, as are you and the other uh, like people on the team. Now, the question is, um, Word on Fire seeks to in, uh, engage the modern world through, um, by evangelizing through media. Is that, that's correct. Is that, is that correct? It's, it's one of the, it's one of the things. I mean, one it's not the, the only thing that we do, but it's, it's one of the core principles that we, that we engage through, through the media. Okay. And we know that Bishop Barron and, and uh, others that are part, as part of the team um, work to, to engage in dialogue, right? To dialogue with, with non-believers, right? So, so that's something that's very important in today's day and age. For someone, for somebody in the audience this evening, who's a Catholic and, uh, they, they have, we all have family and friends that are probably hostile to the Catholic faith, and we pray for them, we fast for them, we try to, to speak to them about the faith, and so far we've been unsuccessful in, in terms of dialoguing with them, um, although we hope when we, we have faith that our prayers will be answered in time. What would you recommend, like for somebody who's not interested in reading uh, for right now, like to, to read Tolkien, because it does require a bit of investment, right? They get a time investment, intellectual investment as well. It's, it's, uh, it's quite dense. Now, what would you recommend, like based on, on uh, any current literature that might be a good vehicle to, to get them to think about God? Oh, that's a very big question. And I'm afraid yeah. that would be something I would, you, you would need to know the person because there is no right. one single 
you know, read this. Um, it really, and, and so what I would say would be to the people who are trying to draw them back, yeah. the key is to, to discern what are their interests and, and, and try to find those points of sort of sacramental truth that are in the, the kinds of things that they like to read, um, that they like to watch. Um, and a number of my colleagues in Word on Fire do a lot of um, like blogging and commentary about popular culture for that exact reason. Like I, for instance, don't really keep up with modern television, but some of my colleagues um, like Andrew Pettiprin um, had been watching WandaVision, which is apparently a big thing. Um, and, and, and actually writing and doing podcasts and discussions about the way that you can discern the Catholic themes and the, you know, engage with the issues there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really, I commend the, you know, the blogging and the other work of, of you know, my various colleagues at Word on Fire, um, just to find the specific places where there's some aspect of a popular show that might in fact be a rejection of the Catholic, you know, the Catholic worldview. But if it's addressing issues of importance, then that's a place you can start talking about the Catholic view. If if the if the show deals with suffering, talk about you know how do we deal with suffering and, and so on. That's that's what I would recommend. Okay, great. So there's a question here now. Another one is so what role does the Holy Spirit have in inspiring the Catholic imagination? Uh, well, the whole role. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much. I mean, that's that is where this where the spirit is, is working in the imagination. Um, because if we're constructing meaning, we're doing it under the guidance of, of the Holy Spirit. I um, mean, it's actually interesting to note that in the medieval view of the imagination, they really felt that the like someone like St. Bonaventure actually specifies that the imagination is a place where Christ is actively mediating. He he puts he puts Christ's action in that mediating action of, of the imagination. And I think we see in all of our imaginative engagement that that's an opening, that's an opening for the Holy Spirit to be working. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And here's a question here for one of our students. So did, did uh, Tolkien have a strong view on the poet T.S. Eliot? Now that's an interesting question. Um, we don't know for sure what he thought about Eliot. We don't have we don't have nearly as much information as, as we would like about lots of things. Okay. But we can say that he had a I would say a cautiously positive view. And this in itself is actually significant because his friend C.S. Lewis is known to have, have absolutely loathed Eliot's poetry and, and just, you know, called it nonsense and just dismissed it out of hand. So it's been very typical for people to assume that, well, of course, Tolkien had that same identical opinion. But that's a, that's a very common mistake to just conflate Lewis and Tolkien. Um, insofar as we know of Tolkien's views, he seems to have been cautiously positive um, and he was saddened uh, when Eliot died. So yeah, he seems to have been more interested and more open to the modernist poets in general than, uh, than I ever would have expected. Okay, and we have another question here, but again, with regards to, um, there's a comment on the works of Tolkien. So uh, this participant loves his works. However, he says that he seems, he seems to be somewhat pessimistic and he sees life as suffering. So Frodo's own, Frodo only finds rest by sailing to the undying lands in the West. Was that, and then to add to that, was that informed by his own personal experience? Again. Well, I think, you know, y yes, um, certainly. I mean, he did, Tolkien went through a lot in his life. I mean, he really, he did, he was an orphan. Um, he, you know, he he fought in the front lines of World War I. Sure. You know, he lived through two world wars. You know, he he, he did experience quite a great, a great deal of suffering. Um, and I think that definitely informs, informs his work in some very significant ways. But I think also that, he has this view with this emphasis on suffering because he's a thoughtful Catholic, because we all are going to suffer and we're all going to die. This is not something that the modern, you know, the modern 21st century person really likes to think about, right. um, especially in the era of modern medicine. You know, we, we don't want to think about pain. We don't want to think about death. You no, know, no, no. Keep it all, you know, keep it all away. But Tolkien faces up to it. We're all going to die. And it's probably going to have a bunch of suffering along the way because that's the that's that's human nature. And even our Lord, you know, didn't escape it, didn't even want to escape it, didn't try to escape it. So I actually think that what looks like pessimism in Tolkien is actually 
realism. It's actually accuracy. And I think this is one of the things that he, he says to us so powerfully um, in the modern day. I, I'm so frustrated with a lot of what passes for Christian art, Christian fiction, poetry, drama, music, you name it. It's all so happy, happy, you know, love Jesus. Yay. Hooray. Resurrection, Easter. Hurrah. Well, great. But there's a, you know, there's a cross to get through on the way. Um, and our Lord has a lot to say about suffering and how we can expect it. And I think we tend to skip way too quickly to the happy ending without attending to how much it's going to hurt to get there. And Tolkien doesn't make that mistake. And that's why I think he's profoundly honest. And we need that honesty because people people catch it. You know, if, they, if we just say all the happy things about Christianity and, and, you know, what does it mean to be a Catholic? Oh, it's so wonderful. Well, what about all the suffering? People will either not believe us because they know that life is suffering or they will believe us and then become disillusioned and then, you know, leave the faith. Yep. Got to be honest. And Tolkien is very honest. And I think that is part of his power. Very good point. Okay. Some, some more good questions. So here's, here's one. Um, you have described some of the possible origins of various characters from the Lord of the Rings, focusing on the hobbits. Do you have any ideas of sources of some of the other, perhaps less noble characters? <laughs> oh, lots. You should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much to get into in, in a Q&A, but, but yes, yes, lots. Um, there's lots of interesting connections. Um, okay. And yeah. Um, Sounds good. And here's, here's another question from, from uh, one of our educators. So there, there are two similar ones, which I'm going to try to put them together and hope I do justice to it. So the first part uh, is, do you have any suggestions, perhaps material to consume to develop the skill in storytelling? And then here's another question I think that is not unrelated. And how do we try to cultivate, inspire the Catholic imagination in young people today? Ah, excellent yeah. questions. Questions after my own heart. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, they, these are actually somewhat separate questions. So in terms of, I'll try to take the second one first. Okay. Um, in terms of inspiring younger people um, to, to like have a lively, well-grounded, vibrant Catholic imagination, yeah. they need to be exposed to lots of good things. Um, you know, it's like, it's kind of like imaginative nutrition. If, if they're only eating junk food, you know, then they're not going to develop. <clears throat> so I think we need to have a wide range of, of, of things. Um, and I also, that's going to include, um, I think a lot of classics. Uh, there's a lot of great works out there, but I think we also have to be careful not to treat the classics as sort of like instant pills for you know, Catholic vision, you know, read this book and you'll, you'll become, you know, all set. People need to be able to follow their interests, follow their tastes. Um, and, and that includes a lot of modern things. You know, there was a time when the Lord of the Rings was, was newly published. Now it's a classic, but it, you know, it was new then. Right. So I think a, a wide ranging, again, that wide ranging capaciousness and Tolkien's a really good model here because he, he's, br he's bridging eras. He's tremendously well-versed in the medieval literature. He also knew Renaissance literature and later literature very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, he had read so widely and he read modern literature. So it's that both and, um, not to say one or the other, but to say both and to kind of put them in dialogue with each other. I think that kind of gets the imaginative juices flowing um, in a really, I think, good way. Uh, and it actually is my hope in, in Tolkien's modern reading that one of the things people will find in it is some ideas about thinking of it. Well, if it was interesting to Tolkien, maybe it would be interesting to, you know, to folks now. Um, and just to see the way that he engages with, you know, with these modern things as well as the, the, the older ones. Now, going to the question about how do we, how do we develop new creative writers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh boy, do we need them? You know, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I do lectures um, and someone will ask me, well, who, who are the modern equivalents to C.S. Lewis and, and J.R.R. Tolkien? And I have to say, uh, well, <laughs> I haven't really got a great list here um, because we've got too many people who are just trying to copy. Like how many books feature young people finding secret lands through a cupboard or something, you know, too many. How many stories do we have where we've got, you know, equivalents of wizards and witches and halflings and a little adventure? Way too many. Because um, people have been copying the form, but not getting the heart of it, not getting the, the deep vision that informed books like Narnia and, and um, The Lord of the Rings. 
and also not writing well. Um, that's the other problem. You, just because you've got a good moral vision um, doesn't mean you can, you know, storytell your way out of a paper bag. Um, and I think we're just too willing to let people, you know, get off scot free for good intentions. Yeah, no. So mm -hmm. we need to be writing and we need to be practicing. We need to be having people who are willing to um, read each other's work, to give feedback, to give criticism, um, to be like the inklings, um, to give that criticism, help each other to be better iron sharpening iron, have high standards, revise, 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 and don't just expect that you write a first draft and it's gonna get picked up by a publisher. Yeah, that ain't how it works. <laughs> And I actually am, it's hard to find this kind of environment. It's very, very hard. And I'm really pleased to say that's actually a new initiative that, that I'm doing within the Word on Fire Institute, um, which is where, you know, I'm going to be teaching a class in creative writing, uh, doing a video course in creative writing, but also we have just formed um, writing groups. It's just about to launch where we're going to have actually a space for small groups of Catholics who want to help each other to become better writers, um, you know, peer mentoring and, and discipling and, and eventually providing feedback and helping each other to grow. Cause that's, we need it. And I don't know any place currently that we can find it, um, but that's what, that's what we need to do. Well, that would be great to even advertise that here at the university. So that would be, that would, I'm sure we have students and uh, that would be interested in that. So we- Well, that'll be part, it's, it's gonna be through the Institute. So if they're interested in joining yeah. the Word on Fire Institute, that is something that we're just on the cusp. I think next week, um, we're going to be launching the, uh, the writing groups. That's great. <laughs> well, one of, our, one of our parishioners is also a professor uh, in English and creative writing. He's a department head. And he just wrote a book on Graham Greene, a very good book. They received mm. uh, an exceedingly favorable review in First Things. Oh. And it was, the review was written by Christopher Hitchens, uh, brother who's a, a devout Anglican, from what I understand. Yep. So I would. So there's another another good book to read. Okay, great. So this is a segue. You mentioned about you, you spoke of the Inklings. Well, here's the final question. So I recall reading that the Inklings specifically advocated for the writing of fantasy rather than literature more generally. Did Tolkien believe that fantasy as a genre is superior to realistic fiction, or? that it is the way stories ought to be told? And if so, why? Uh, excellent question. Um, in the, I would say that Tolkien, Tolkien held fantasy in very high regard as a literary mode. Um, and until I started researching Tolkien's modern reading, I might have said that he felt that it was superior to other modes. Mm -hmm. I would not say that anymore because he read, as, as I discovered, he read so widely and he praised you know, a number of authors and, and read a lot of them who were not fantasy authors. Mm -hmm. So clearly he found a great deal of value in other forms, mm -hmm. but he, he, he says, actually he says this in a, in a letter to his son, Christopher, that he actually tried at first to engage with contemporary events by keeping a diary. Um, and this didn't work out for him. And he ended up switching to transforming it into fantasy. So he even was willing to try first a more kind of realistic, you know, day-to-day -day mode, you know, diary keeping. Um, and for him, it didn't, it wasn't the way that resonated with him. And so he switches over to fantasy and then he ends up defending fantasy um, because it gets, you know, it did then and still now it tends to get a bad rap of being, oh, it's just escapist nonsense. So this draws him to the defense to articulate a very powerful case for the value of fantasy, which we get in his, his wonderful essay on fairy stories. Um, and I think that that doesn't mean that he thought it was necessarily superior to other forms, but it's the form that he worked in and it was the form that needed to be defended as a viable literary form and one that because it was his form, he could articulate the way that it worked. Um, and I think this also goes, goes for reading. You know, Tolkien was perfectly aware that not everybody liked fantasy and he was completely okay that not everybody would like his, his novels. He, okay, if you don't like them, don't read them. <laughs> um, fantasy is one literary mode. It's a very powerful one, um, but it's not going to appeal, appeal to everybody. And you know what? That is completely okay. All right. I, 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 uh, I lied. There's one more. Okay. So the question is this. Now it has to do again with Tolkien himself. You seem to know quite a bit about him. Now, in your opinion, do you believe that he will one day be canonized? 
Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I certainly think that it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in my research on him, I ended up learning a great deal about him, just really digging into you know, his life. Um, and in a way, kind of having to get into his head, you know, I was trying to figure out what he thought about modern literature kind of meant thinking his thoughts after him, you know, reading things that he had read and then seeing what he said about them. And, and I have to say, I started out my research, I, I have loved Tolkien for all of my life. I had been thinking seriously about Tolkien for more than 30 years. I loved Tolkien. And yet after 10 years of delving into his, his work, his life, his writings, his thoughts, I loved him even more. I wouldn't have thought it was possible, but I did. And one of the things that just came across very vividly, just a kind of a cumulative case, is just the fundamental goodness of this man, mm -hmm. that he was just deeply virtuous in a completely English, down to earth, you know, non-ostentatious, self-deprecating way. He was just an amazingly good man. And he, he would have been the first to admit his own failings, but he was just deeply good all the way through. And the more that we've learned about him, um, the more that I just, I see that. So, you know, and if you think too about his witness as, as a Catholic, I mean, he, he shows that you can live a life of, well, I would actually say is heroic virtue mm -hmm. in a very ordinary sense. He had lots of papers to grade. He had four children to raise, you know, he had lots of bills that he sometimes worried about having the means to pay. Um, you know, he was a very, in some ways, very ordinary man, although he was an extraordinary man in terms of a genius. So he, yeah, I think, you know, he's, he's worthy, <laughs> I think, of someday of, of being recognized um, in the canon of the saints. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you to all, all of our participants that uh, we're, we're going to, the, the, the video is, well, will be available in the next couple of days. We'll have it on our website and YouTube channel. And um, I pray for all of you that you have a very fruitful Lent as we continue on towards the celebration of Holy Week. We're very grateful that we're able to have the public celebration of Mass once more. Uh, as you recall from last year, the, the whole world was basically on the lockdown. And uh, therefore, the Holy Week Masses, all of the liturgies were celebrated privately by the priests. So it's great to be able to celebrate in the presence of, of uh, brothers and sisters. And I hope that um, we're able to see each other in person sometime. We had talked about bringing a group of students, a group of parishioners from, from the Newman Center to visit you during your summer studies at Oxford. I really hope that that, it, that becomes a possibility, probably not this year, but maybe next summer or two years from now. It would be great to, uh, to be able to continue on with this discussion in a, in a beautiful environment uh, as is Oxford as well. So thank you so much. We have, um, this was our final Faith and Reason lecture for the academic year. Our first uh, lecture will take place for 2021-22, will take place on the 15th of September. Again, all that information will be published in the upcoming issue of The Torch. And we have Dr. Mary Eberstadt, and we're hoping that she'll be able to come to Toronto at that point. And it is on Primal Screams on the, the, the roots of identity politics, a very fitting topic. And we look forward to having you then. Um, the next um, art series that we have, the next segment of that will take place next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. So Father Eric Nikolai will be presenting on um, the, the passion, right? The passion and crucifixion of our Lord um, as, gleaned through, as evidenced through um, sacred art. So we look forward to that. I think this will be the third the third or the fourth um, presentation that Father has given here. And it's a way of kind of getting ready for Holy Week, right? Entering into this, the beautiful mystery of, uh, of God's love for us. And so, Holly, thank you so much. And we conclude with a prayer and we'll see you again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you continue to pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us here present. Lord, touch our hearts. Help us to truly understand the great love that you have for us and help us to respond, Lord, by a life worthy of the name Christian. And may God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Thank you so much.
Excellent.